really excited for our, our next speaker. His name is, uh, you know, as synonymous with design ops as uh, Canadians is with apologizing, almost, right? Uh, he's a veteran digital designer, design educator, and design leader. Uh, Dave's diverse background covers a breadth of context, large and small, commercial, consumer agency, and internal. He started his own practice due to his passion for helping designers be better at designing and to create the most value. Dave crosses the boundaries of design, research, and strategy to bring about success for his clients. He'll be talking all about design ops. Let's have a big round of applause for Dave Malouf. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Whew. Whoa, it's bright. Hello, everyone. Let's see, how do I get my slide? There I am. So, amplify. That's, that's been my word for a while now. Um, and hopefully when you come out of this talk, you'll, you'll understand and maybe embrace it as much as I do. But Amplify is my mission, uh, definitely as a design operator, but also as a, just a designer. This talk is about value, uh, value of design. And so, in the value of design operations. But we need to actually understand, button? Of course, it's going to do that. Uh, back. You gave away my punchline. <laughs> so first, we're going to need to talk about, well, what is that value of design? And I, I did give away the punchline just with the title of the talk. The value of design is that design is an amplifier. We take everything that we can be applied to in our work and we make it better when we are allowed to do the work the way that our work works best. Now, we may be familiar with this idea of the stool, that it's a partnership. It's all about balance. You know, you have design, and you have tech, and you have the business, and we're trying to create this diagram where, like, the middle is the sweet spot, right? Um, and I'm not buying that so much anymore. And it's because of this realization that this is about a process of amplification. And amplification isn't just a design thing. It actually works the whole system. And the way I got here was I started to imagine <laughs> what the world might be like if there was no design. If we didn't do our jobs, if we decided to do anything else, and there's lots of noble careers we could all be doing that have nothing to do with design that would be totally worth the world um, that we live in and, and help. But if design wasn't there, um, what would happen? And we've seen successful examples in our own industries where especially user-centered design or human-centered design wasn't in place and we've had success, right? We can just jump straight to Craigslist and see that. It's heir apparent. But then there's even bigger successes like eBay early on as well as uh, early and some would argue even late Amazon. Um, and we can also talk about things like Jira and stuff like that. These are examples where there's huge success. Companies like SAP and Siemens and Oracle, success without a concerted, directed, intentional effort of human-centered design. So we need to be able to explain success without us if we're going to be able to explain why need us. So let's dig into this a little bit more. So first bit is no, no value exists without creation. I don't mean creativity. I literally mean creation. Without production, without delivery, without that building process, there is no value. It's at the core. It's at the beginning of everything that we want to be doing. And you can do lots of wonderful things if you just build, right? I could build a house without anything else other than just building. It may not be pretty. It may not be perfect. The wet wall may be in the wrong place with a lack of planning or whatever. But the house, four walls, keep me warm, do the job. Then we bring in this idea of engineering. And in the digital world, 
we often think of engineering and development or engineering and production as really the same thing, but they aren't. Engineering is a form of planning. And in many parts of the larger non-digital industrial world, engineers are separate from those who build or separate from those who manufacture, right? You have a mechanical engineer who sends specs to a factory which then creates the tooling process that creates manufacturing, right? Um, you have civil engineers who are responsible for making sure that the work of an architect, which is the designer, is built correctly, so forth and so on. After engineering, the next part of this expansion is the business. And the business, in its most reductive sense, gives engineering and gives production direction and provides packaging, provides a go-to market, and then thus amplifies that value or amplifies the, the means of value, if you will, from that. And in the shortened version, you get to design. That design amplifies that. Design can be applied to all of those things to help each one amplify itself and even amplifies design. That design is sort of recursive in that way that it's self-amplifying and creates customer value. In this image, we have a wonderful example of teamwork, right? Um, this image has been used as an example for like lean and agile recently. However, it is the best example of big design up front that you can imagine. The amount of pre-design that goes into this particular moment, the amount of rehearsal over and over again that a pit crew goes in at every given moment is probably equivalent to an astronaut before they load onto a shuttle or wherever they get in these days to get to the space station. There is a tremendous amount of rehearsal into this. That's A. B, nowhere in this image of executioners is the designer. However, the designer, the planner of this system amplified over and over again by constantly revising and changing how it is that they've done this. If you looked at a picture 10 years ago of a pit crew, A, it would probably be smaller, and B, it would probably not look nearly as synchronized as this group has been. There's been an evolution of how this team is done. But the designer isn't even in the picture to enjoy the spoils. We seldom are. So. <clears throat> Here I am talking about design operations, but I haven't yet talked about what is it that design operations is amplifying. And to do that, we need to understand what design does to be an amplifying force. So what is it that I am amplifying? How is that happening? So we're gonna look at a few examples of the different pieces that makes great design happening, what happens to make sure it goes well, what are those activities we need to understand before we can operationalize them? Because at its core, I heard a vibrate, it's supposed to work. At its core, great design happens because of great designing. The verb actually precedes the noun every time. So, Let's talk about some of these verbs. The first one is form giving. At its core, at its essence, design, while it is a, sometimes called planning, those plans are forms. It could just be a Gantt chart as your design. That's the quintessential form of planning, right? Project planning. More likely, it's something else. It could be sketches. It could be graphic models that we create so that we can understand things. And it can be maybe three-dimensional forms that are created or digital forms or whatever come along with that. And then there's the production forms. There's the form of the poster, this graphic form, this Bauhaus poster. 
There's the form of Maybe I need new batteries. Maybe that's the problem. There's the form of a UI, right? This classic Swiss grid system was put in place by the wonderful folks at Microsoft not too long ago. Won its awards because of that. And even before that, there's the work from Braun. Maybe. 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 Was it this bad for everyone else? <laughs> it keeps vibrating on me, but not. Braun. <laughs> so, uh, Braun in this classical interface, in physical form, right? So the first thing is the, the forms that we give. But then there's sort of this purpose underlying form that gives more value. If we just created forms and happenstance, that's one thing. But there's something to that how. There's like a modifier that we need to add to it. how long I press the button? Am I supposed to point in a certain direction? Should I only stand here? Or should I only stand there? Oh, the computer's over there. OK, thank you. Very helpful, gentlemen. I will stand over here. <sighs> Clarity. <laughs> Clarity. Um, if there's any purpose to the forms that we create, it's to create a clear message, to create a clearer understanding. And those forms can be in language. Those forms can be in graphics, again, in solids, in spaces. They all sort of, not sort of, they all denote some attempt at clarity. Do we always achieve it? No. But it's an attempt at that clarity. And not just clarity of that communication style of clarity, but we also want to create an understanding, a clarity of relationships, of connections with each other, of navigation, right? We need to have an information architecture, which is its own form married to the more skeletal forms um, that we put on top of it. The next one is around behavior and about behavioral fit. And there's two sides, to this two sides to this coin of behavior. There's the behaviors that we design in the forms that we create, and there's the behaviors that we're attempting to map our behaviors for. There's the behaviors of people, their culture, their personalities, their social ways of, of working. What makes something comfortable? What makes something awkward? Those are cultural or constructs, and they relate to the mindsets and we have to understand those and apply that understanding to the forms that we're doing just as much as we need things to be clear. We need things to fit as well. One example of this is uh, the growing trend uh, among uh, airports to be using facial recognition and biometrics as their interaction model moving forward, right? Uh, when I got on my plane in the US, we have a company called Clear. Two fingers through. That was it. They didn't scan my boarding pass. They didn't look at my ID when I went through TSA. That was it. I did have to still go and get x rayed and stuff, but that was a step. In this case, coming through um, customs or passport control in Singapore, it was a gate. No human being, no human, inter no human interference whatsoever. Again, they grabbed some biometric. They viewed and compared my existing image to my passport image, scanned my passport, did some retinal eye just to get more bio information so they can track me later, and I'm through. Just gate. Welcome to your country. It just fits the behavior. It means there's no lines, which is what we all want to avoid, our lines. One of my favorite new interaction models of behavioral fit is my AirPods. I'm a, it took me forever to get AirPods because I already had really expensive headset and I just had to wait for those to break before I could buy new ones, and they did, and I bought them a month ago right before the Plows came out, 
And now I am like, hey, my 13-year-old son, don't you want these old clunky things that, and I'll get the pros, but mm, he says, no, I want the pros as a smart 13-year-old would say. But what I love about the way that Apple has gone about so much of their interaction design of their hardware integrations is they're so seamless. You hit the back button, you put your AirPods pretty much next to your device, and voila, a beautiful graphic image goes up and says connect. You hit connect, all of a sudden you get that doodad of a dialogue and it shows you the power and it shows you the picture of your device, giving you clear confirmation of the device in play to your device and it looks as beautiful on picture as it will on your ears, right? The Wi-Fi access is the same way. When you wanna do Wi-Fi and you have multiple devices, passing that from one to another is really easy as well as um, uh, the controls for um, um, two-factor authentication, right? Your bank sends you a text message, text message is read, and as soon as you go to put the six-digit code in, it auto-completes, or it gives you the option to auto-complete because it read your text message and you hit one button instead of six. Those kinds of behavioral fit, those kinds of connecting the outside system to the inside system are the kinds of behavioral fit that we can be doing if we are given the chance. So the fourth aspect is exploration. It's not experimentation, and I think of those as two different things, and people can ask me about that later. Other parts of any team explore, but there's something about the way that design explores, or the way that the explorational aspect of design is, is in a primary way that design makes value. So we talked before about just drawing a single sketch, but the real way to do this is to explore a multiplicity of rough entities so that we can begin a process of association and doing all of these connections together so that we can be creating what couldn't have been created unless those connections were made, right? There's that level of exploration to make those connections. We also explore through stories. The actual process of creating a story is the process of connecting a moment one to the next. Probably the biggest shift in my career as an interaction designer was that moment when I started using story as the primary structure for how I designed interactions because it started allowing me to contextualize things with people, as well as to constantly reflect the, con the context of one part of the space against another part of the space. So those are the four pieces that give value. So why, what is keeping us from doing this to our most capability? What is keeping us from amplifying the value of our organizations to the penultimate, right? And I think we're amazing, talented people. We have plenty of talent in this room across all of our organizations. And my experience is that there's a ceiling that talent and process and method can only take us so far. And that's been part of my journey. And part of this journey is that for the last 10 years, we have all been arriving at Stockholm Syndrome. But who's keeping us captive? How is that happening? How is it that we are now captives unconsciously that we have been giving up our power of amplifying value? It's basically we have been living at the whim of development and product. And I don't mean to demonize. They aren't trying to keep us down. But what's worse is we have been playing so much to that game that we've been keeping ourselves down through that process. We want to measure ourselves the way they want us to be measured. They want us to hire our people the way they hire their people. They want us to fit into their process, which may or may not actually accentuate our own, may not amplify our own, may not operationalize our own nearly as well. But let's do it. Let's see that happen. Let's talk their language, and let's give away our own in that process. So, how many of you work in agile environments? 
and just dissed all of your environments, right? Okay. Agile in itself is not an evil thing. We'll talk about that in a second. It's not the problem. It's bigger than that. However, here's the Agile Manifesto on its page, agilemanifesto.org. Okay? It's a very, very simple thing, which means it's open to a ton of interpretation, which is the first problem. Okay? The second thing is, is that it really only comes down to two sections. There's the top part, and then there's these lines of this over that, this over that, this over that, which are really only four lines. Right? And then there's the bunch of people who did that thing on the bottom 20 years ago, practically. But here's the gist of it. This was written with one thing in mind. This was written with the idea of developing software. Developing software. It's not a way to develop requirements. It's not a way of understanding contexts of software's use. It's not a way of delivering better value to users. It is not intended in any way in which it was written to create better design. It just wasn't. Yet for 20 years, it has been, out of all of the agile things, this has been the least agile part of the whole thing. We haven't changed it. We haven't evaluated it at all, right? There's tons of methods all doing different things, but if you look at it, Scrum has basically been unchanged. What we do is we splinter, right? So now there's less and there's safe, right? Safe now has design thinking, really, does it, right? All they did was change the picture. They didn't really change anything else around it. Safe is not safe. And all of this has been corrupted by those who speak to optimization. Like I said, Agile is not a problem by itself. Its job is to make great software. However, people heard that word Agile, and they heard cheap. They heard fast. They heard yesterday. Right? Go fast and break things. That's agile. If we break and we break and we break and we break, we go fast. Well, how about not break things? How about understanding that if I break something over here, there's consequences to that? That if I break a model of advertising, that maybe I'm breaking something else. Maybe if I go out and I break the taxi association, Maybe I'm breaking something else. That there's consequences to this, right? And that's an outside of the design issue. So I have a new question that's really just for design and for design operators to be thinking about how we operationalize ourselves, not have other people operationalize for us. And that is how might we make design happen better? How do we make designing happen better? What does it take to make those four things that I talked about our focus of how we do, how we provide value to the system and let others' APIs work with us as much as our APIs work with them? The interfaces need to be bi-directional, not unidirectional, and there may be need for middleware in between because of incompatibilities. So, think of this as a little manifesto for better design for a better future. First one here is different activities happen at their own appropriate cadence. That what one activity does in two weeks may take two days for another activity, may take five weeks for another kind of activity in order for it to create enough value to be worthy of segmentation, to be worthy of a learning moment, if you will. Intentional space and processes encourage serendipity, emergence, and exploration. The current open plan environments that most of us work in, while studio is often seen as open, the current open plan environments aren't really working for us. The backhand worked. <laughs> it's a balance of both qualitative and quantitative data. It's synthesized into actionable insights. 
You need both to work. Collaboration and inclusion are balanced with a coordinated focused effort. The difference between coordination and collaboration, collaboration is a moment where work is done together. Coordination is when we go out with assigned tasks and come back later to see what we've done. You need both, but you need both, not one or the other. The exploration of multiple narratives needs to happen through this process. We understand that what attracts and motivates designers may be different than other parts of the organization. When we manage people who are creative, who are researchers, who are different than the other parts of the organization, we need to create a people operations that works to fit for them. And last, whoops, back. Oh, no way. Not my day. We mutually understand and value the quality of design output and the quality of the process that is the process for it. Just notice the laughter on the caption thing and like, <laughs> how much is that happening during this talk, right? <laughs> but how? How does this guide us as operators for those who take on the role as operators, for those who are leading? a team that has to acknowledge operations, whether it's their title or not. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of deeper into this stuff. So, this is a direct counter to most implementations of Agile, right? This idea that you can't have a single cadence. Now there are other implementations of Agile, such as Kanban, which works on release cycle, which is still a delivery component, right? Um, but doesn't have like that static cadence. However, time boxing is a great thing. You wanna have time boxes, but you want the right time boxes for the activities, right? Also, I wanna to speak to dual track a little bit, a little bit uh, later in the conversation. Um, it's because of time, space. So we need to have spaces that allow us to do more allow us to be creative, externalize the work around us so that we can interact with it, so we can have accidents. That's what serendipity is, right? It's happy accident that allows us to find what couldn't be findable before. And the open space is not always the best option for everyone, understand that. So having dynamic spaces. This is an example of a space that I had at one company that I really appreciated. When I had it, it's a pod. You can make that pod as many different people in it. Um, you can put in whatever you want. To shortcut this a little bit, the high top in the middle is the key element. Not the whiteboards, not the movable walls, the high top. The high top is the key element because it allows anyone on the team to walk over to that high top and say, I got something. I got a problem, I want to ship. Whatever it is, I want to just shoot the shit. It doesn't matter, right? But that high top that you stand at is this impromptu, improv moment where you can have ad hoc things happen. And that is one of the keys. The external space is also key. So, we have to balance both quant and qual to synthesize ideas. It's the methods for creating, it's the way we instrument data, it's the dashboards and repositories that make those things accessible to others all coming together in that way. But we need to be able to do it in a way that allows for a balance of activity. And so, how many people are familiar with dual track? So dual track is this notion of discovery and delivery being these parallel tracks that any scrum team can be working on at any given time, right? Um, you can even separate it where some people on the team are doing one and some people on the other, but the idea is that they answer different questions, they have different learning opportunities. And this was put forward by people like Marty Kagan um, and Jeff Patton. And when I was listening to them, I was thinking, this is awesome. This is like I was working in an engineering organization at the time that Marty Kagan came to do his first workshop. And so I was really excited. I was like, oh, 
perfect, I get to now have user-centeredness. The problem was this top part was missing from their model. They had no means for us, for example, to just understand the lives of system administrators. Not how do system administrators um, operate firewalls, because that would be at the product space, and a scrum team would be assigned to the firewall. No, no, no. How do I understand the lives of system administrators? What are their desks set up like? Do they even have a desk? How many monitors do they have? What is their workflow from the moment that they walk through the door to the moment they leave? These were the questions that were going to help the entire organization, but had no place within the team's research team, within the team's way that it was structured around these two tracks. It wasn't there. So we had to figure out a way to add it. And we were, we were able to add it. But each track runs at a different cadence too. And then on the qualitative, quantitative side, you have to make things visible. It's not just enough for someone to just give a spreadsheet report out. People need to live with these numbers and make them their own in order for them to become useful. So collaboration in inclusive space, uh, inclusive ways of working. Um, are just as important. It goes back to the double model here. Double diamond, discover, define, develop, deliver. We get to go out and go in. People operations, it's so, <laughs> it's oversimplified in this manifesto. It by itself could have its own manifesto. And a lot in the design ops world, the people ops is sometimes overly ignored for program management and things like that. And we have to work on aligning value. This is probably the biggest problem I have seen in the clients that I go to, is that even among the design organization, no one understands how to articulate their own value as designers to the greater organization. I'm not talking about ROI. I haven't talked about ROI at all. I'm talking about what is your value that you provide the organization? Why are you hired? Is it to push a pixel or is it something else? Hopefully something else. So let's bring it all together. We have our pit crew, a different one. Design operations through these manifesto, through this thing, will carry the burden of operations so that your designers can design. If your designers aren't designing, they're doing operations. So why not have a practice that does that so that your designers can do the, uh, do the things that they're hired to do to create that value? And it creates more time. Efficiency does come into this. There is an optimizational component to it. You will get more time through operations. If you spend more time, and you have more focus of the efficiency within that amount of time, I guarantee you will start to increase quality. Clearer communications will come into play. You'll have better hiring and better people management. You'll have better retention, better engagement. And you'll concentrate on getting the right tools and infrastructure in front of your people so they're not being burdened by things that are getting in their way. How many people work here in a regulated industry? Yeah, I feel for you. Man, tools, tools are hard in a regulated industry. My last three clients have all been financial. I can't even tell you the story that happened last night to me, I just can't. It's just too bad, and you'll guess my client, and it'll be bad. <laughs> I'll get sued. It won't be pretty. So <laughs> the next thing that they can help with is generating values, generating principles, so that we understand how we make decisions, how we hold to our own governance. And all of this leads to design being amplified. And if design is amplified, your whole company gets amplified. Thanks. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much, Dave. That Bye. was really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> that was a great talk to sum up quite a few themes that have been touched upon by the various speakers uh, this morning. So thank you so much for that.